I'm Kamal Obeid. I have a master's degree in civil and structural engineering from the University of California at Berkeley. I've been a practicing engineer for the last 30 years, a licensed structural engineer for the last 25 years. I've designed and retrofitted numerous st uh, structural steel frame buildings. Uh, I've also looked at several failures of buildings as well to determine the cause. Building 7 to me is, is really what gives it away uh, because that's a classic case of controlled demolition. So when you look at the building itself, when you observe the footage of how the building failed, and then when you look at the analysis that was put forth by National Institute of Standards, NIST, and compare that to what you actually observe in reality. For, for a structural engineer, you, you will actually see that in this huge document that, that took them eight years to put together, every one of these theories is flawed. The building falls right into its footprint. Now, the building itself is, is, a, is a modern structural steel frame building. It's, it's essentially the exterior skin of the building is a tube uh, structure that extends 47 stories high. What, what that means is that all the vertical elements, the columns, and all the horizontal em elements of the, of the exterior skin of the building are welded together in such a, in such a form that to make it ductile. So in other words, you'd really have to twist any of those members individually to try to, to, to fail these connections. And in fact, uh, when you look at the failure as explained by, by NIST, and when you look at the, the, the animation of the failure of how the building fails, and I think they, they disprove their own theories because the computer animation is based on uh, a, a frame analysis of the, of the building where the, the interior connections are failing and, and there's actually pull and, and, and forces on the, on the building. Uh, what these forces are doing, they're actually pulling in, inwards, on the exterior skin. And when you pull in on the exterior skin, you, you're not really causing kinks as much as you are causing a displacement, a, a, a more like a, a controlled uh, deformation of the exterior face of the building inwards. As a result, because the connections are not really subjected to these extreme twists as, as they would need to in order to, I mean, in order to get the, the severe conditions so that makes it fail, what you have instead is are slight deformations, slight enough that the, the, you have the, the, the wall, the, the, the structural members actually uh, bending, but not yet kinking enough to, to break. And that's what the, the, the model shows. The bottom line is that in order to fail this building the way it actually failed, you'd have to essentially, uh, in, a, in a controlled sequence, remove the support of several building columns, pr probably most likely on the, on the lower floors. And that's how, because you, when you see the actual drop of the building it, it coming down gradually, you, you can see the top face of the building is not really failing yet. It's, it's really the lower floors that start to fail. And then likely moving up in a sequence of actually severing columns as you go up on the inside. The exterior columns on the outside, on the outside as well as on the inside, at the bottom would have to be severed almost at the same time. The, the official explanation is that the initiating event of this collapse of the building was as a result of what's called furniture fires. Initially, they, they had the uh, theory that fuel from storage tanks that were there that had actually ignited as a result of the debris that fell into the building, and that heated the building, heated certain elements of the building so much that it caused failure. And then the actual failure, uh, controlled demolition occurred by severing the columns at the lower floors simultaneously in a controlled fashion. The official explanation, according to NIST, is that the failure actually initiated on the 12th floor. And then that in, in, initial failure has actually progressed vertically and then horizontally and then failed the entire core of the structure. And then after that, the building started coming down. 
So that's an extremely unlikely scenario. You have to actually sever the, the columns on the, on the lower floors, below where, where they say they, the failure initiate, initiated. The, the initiating event is that one girder failed as a result of thermal expansion and then pushing off its seat. But the problem with that is that in order for, for the next step to occur, let's say, let's say, let's give them the benefit of the doubt that the one girder fails. In order for, for the column to fail, which is the next step in their theory, you have to have several beams all around this column failing at the, at the same time over four floors on, on the building and, and thereby leaving the column, what, as they call it, unbraced over the four stories high. And this hypothesis is that several floors, many floors actually failed uh, and left this column, this column number 79, unbraced over this number of floors high. But the problem with that is that th this column in particular, column number 79, is not only braced by the beam that they, the alleged failure, but it's also braced by other beams on the other side. And those beams would have also needed to, to fail in order for the column to buckle. All these events, unlikely events that led to the core failure. Let's assume they're, they're, they're all okay. I mean, so that, that the building was induced to fail on the inside. So now you, you, you're failed on the inside and you're, you're progressing horizontally and you want to fail on the outside. And so the interior elements are pulling on the exterior face of the building. And the redundancies are such that the, the, the face of the building actually bends and deflects and deforms and it doesn't fail. So, um, so I mean, it, it, it has so much ductility that it, under, the, under the events that are leading up to the global failure of the building, it is impossible for it, for it to fail the way they said for, that it failed, especially at that speed that uh, you could observe the building coming down. They first said that the girder expanded first, sheared the bolts that, that, the, that uh, the girder was, was connected to with a column. And then the, the beams actually expanded and pushed the girder off its seat. First the girder expands, shears the bolts, then the, the, the beams actually expand and push the girder. I'm not uh, a thermodynamic engineer, but I can, I can say, I mean, just common sense and from my knowledge of thermodynamics, that when you're heating a structural element, first of all, with the fireproofing and everything, uh, you're not going to heat it uniformly throughout. And, and typically in fires, you're heating the bottom flange of, of, the, of the, let's say, this girder. And if you're hitting the bottom flange of the girder, and the top flange of the girder is, is, stays cool as a result of its contact with the slab, then what's going to happen, instead of expansion, what you're going to have is actually sagging, which is typically what you see in fires. And so the, the sagging would actually relieve any, any put, uh, possible expansion that could occur within the slab. The girder is actually, if it has the shear studs on it, it, it is actually designed so that it can deflect and the, the, uh, the shear studs would, would actually react up against this slab and, and thereby actually forcing the girder to deflect even more as a result of that, since especially the bottom flange is heated. So the, the mode of movement would be to sag and not to expand. This contradicts the theory that the girder actually expanded uniformly and sheared the bolts off the seat they did not have the benefit of reviewing the actual structural steel because the structural steel was gone. It was made to disappear. I mean, how can, how can you have a complete theory? At least in the NIST report, you should actually make a huge issue about the lack of evidence or the lack of um, specimens uh, to really explain the failure of this building. This is the crime of the century. And it is important that we know everything that had to do with this. But also as important, maybe not as important, is for the sake of the profession, as a professional structural engineer, I'd really like to know the truth why these buildings failed. And this is completely, I'm, I'm unconvinced 
entirely by the theories that that uh, the, the NIST has put forth. I mean, it is, this will take a huge amount of investment and time and resources to be able to investigate this thing properly and, and actually analyze it properly. And it has affected many people's lives. It has affected, because it happened in the United States, it, it has affected the whole planet in, in one way or another. It, it has shifted the... Uh, politics of of the, of the of the world, and it, and it must be investigated for that reason. But also, the structural engineers and the profession needs to, need to understand that these buildings did not fail the, the way they're claimed to have failed. That's a very key uh, issue. That that all of that becomes transparent. The all the evaluation, all the uh, facts behind the failure become become evident to the to the entire public.